get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of RX Bars, Hint Water, P90X, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25 hosts in-person VIP events and masterminds for top entrepreneurs all over the country, including many events in the e-commerce industry. We hosted this past year events in Austin, Chicago, Santa Barbara, San Diego, New York, Sonoma, Las Vegas, probably more I'm forgetting, uh, probably a city near you. If you see the value of immersing yourself with other top entrepreneurs to connect and collaborate to get your business to the next level, I know Eddie does because he goes to tons of conferences. Um, Go to rise25.com, contact us to find out when and where our next event is going to be. And I'm very excited. You know, not many people who I interview are also uh, local in Chicago. Today we have Eddie Levine, co-founder and ho- of a wholesale e-commerce and brand management company, which he started in 2012 with his business partner, Greg Gilpin. They have created a multi-million dollar e-commerce operation in a very short period of time. And they specialize in purchasing products directly from manufacturers, distributors, and brand owners warehouse them all under their own roof and sell on various channels. They also, like I mentioned, do brand management, which is probably everything under the sun for a brand, I imagine. So we'll talk about that. Um, If he weren't busy enough, he has an information and consulting arm of his e-commerce business, um, which is you can find it at wholesalebreakthrough.com where he teaches others how to tap into the business opportunity. And we'll talk about that and about how there's no set way to do this type of business and how he structured that piece. Um, And in his limited free time, uh, he's also director of operations for the nonprofit Last for the Troops, which helps raise funds to help increase awareness of traumatic brain injuries and PTSD. He's also going to be traveling to D.C. because he does um, judging of DECA Nationals, which is what, an entrepreneur trip. An entrepreneurship competition, right? Yes. Youth, youth business organization, so high school students. So, Eddie, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. So many questions, so little time here. Um, first of all, the transition. I want to talk about the transition from, and you probably got some, I've heard people who go through CDW get amazing training. Yep. And the transition from, CDW to your own business? Because I know from my research, you started this business in 2012 out of your garage with $5,000 of credit card debt. So I want to hear some of the scary times early on. Now it maybe seems like you're in office, you're doing well. Um, Back then, it may not have been so obvious. Yeah. So I mean, if I had the problems that I had back then today, I'd be be thrilled. (laughs) Um, You know, growing pains, but that's fine. Um, yeah, no. So I, you know, I came from a, a large IT company, CDW, before I started this business. Um, and, and I tell everybody, look, you know, the, the company that I worked for there, the, the job I had there, it was a great company. It was a great job that I had. I mean, the, the people that I was that I was around, great people. I didn't have, I didn't leave with my, with any hesitations whatsoever, or, or you know, bad taste in my mouth. But um, here's the thing: the business that I have today is not my first business. This is actually my fourth or fifth business, depending on how, which ones you want to count. But I was a business owner, I would I like to say, since I was maybe eight, nine, ten years old, because I did things like setting up my own lemonade stand at the end of my driveway, figuring out how much how I could target people that were walking in the neighborhood instead of driving, you know, increase my sales, right? Um, I did uh, selling wrapping paper and chocolates from my elementary school uh, when I was a lot younger. We did that over the holiday season. Um, I was doing I run two or three thousand dollars over the course of a month when I was ten years old. That's pretty good. Um, and then I was doing eBay. Um, when I was much younger for... What were you selling on eBay? So that was a consignment-based business. Um, So that was instead of buying product and selling it like I do today, that was going to people in the neighborhood who were um, looking to get rid of stuff that they had that they no longer wanted, and I would obviously take a commission. But I did that a little bit differently because the people that I saw that doing that business, they would either A, set up a shop and have people come to them by means of advertising, or they would advertise to such a large group of people in the audience or or in in the area. The way I did it was a little bit more special. Um, I targeted people who were either A, 
moving and had their house listed for sale. Mm. B, had, were having a garage sale because I knew that they would have things they were looking to move. So my overall rate of return was tremendously increased. And it's a no-brainer offer. Yeah, exactly. Because it's consignment. They, 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 exactly. They have stuff they want to get rid of. I'm giving them an offer and, you know, it works no. out. <laughs> so talk about your what's your no-brainer offer to brands? Because I'm sure you're you're savvy enough as a ten year old to have listen, no cost to you. I sell it, then we both make money. Yep. Yep. Not so, many ten year olds are thinking of that and translate to today. Yeah. So I mean, fast forward to what we do today. I mean, it's it's um, put it this way: brands are for the last number of decades, right? They've been used. They've been used to selling products through brick and mortar retail channels. That's how. That's how it's been. That's how it's evolved for for years. How are they? I was walking around a mall like uh, last week, and I was wondering how are some of these places in business because the competition has got to be so high and the rent has got to be so high. You, you got to find a speaker that speaks on retail. <laughs> <laughs> right. But uh, but I mean, but but here's the thing. You know, brands have brands have seen uh, the, the smart ones have seen that that the the way of doing commerce today is is online. Uh, whether it be through your own website or Amazon or what have you, there's there's multiple ways of doing it, right? But too many brands are stuck in how they get that done. It's not as easy as just putting products online and selling it. There's there's the piece of making sure your brand is represented well, that it's not being you know uh, sold by people who shouldn't be selling it. Um, it's not being advertised by people who are not advertising it in the proper way, um, and you are neck and neck and exceeding your competition for similar products because you know all those things kind of go in one and unless you're doing all those together and really showcasing your brand as much as possible and and you know watching the things that could negatively impact you uh, you could have a real problem as you could go to try to expand your brand presence so objections mm -hmm. you've probably you know you talk a lot about approaching it from their point of view yep so what's their point of view um, cause like you were saying, they may think, oh, I just slap it up on Amazon or something and I'll start selling it. Or maybe they don't think that. I don't know. Well, the brand, when I talk about looking at it from the brand's perspective, I mean, putting yourself in their shoes, right? So and this is what I do any, anytime in business. Um, when you approach somebody, you obviously have a pitch, right? That you want to lead with or that you're trying to make work for, to, to benefit you. But you, you've got to remove that word you from the equation, right? So instead of approaching them with my pitch, I, I go up to a brand owner and you know, my meet them at trade shows. That's, that's my go-to approach um, because I like that face-to-face -face interaction, but I'm going to them and I'm in my head, I'm thinking, okay, they're at the show all day long. They're having people approach them saying, Hey, can I sell your product? Hey, can I, can I sell it on Amazon? Hey, can I, I, you know, I can resell your product, whatever. It gets very old. Right. And what happens there is if you're just one of those people, I, I call them just another reseller. The problem is, what happens, there's nothing to separate yourself apart from anybody else, right? And do you have money to spend and buy product? Yeah, but what happens when the next person comes to as a bigger bankroll, right? There's nothing tying you to that vendor. So it's that it's that one-on-one -on -one approach. It's that, hey, this guy listened to me, and this guy really gets what my pain points are or what I've struggled with or what my problems have been in the past. This guy's willing to hear me out. You know, he's actually hitting on the points that actually impact me as a business owner. So I find that when I approach someone in that sense and I talk to them, you know, specifically geared towards their own pain points, which obviously each conversation is different. Yeah. I have a lot more success. You know, it's smart because um, everyone has different pain points, right? What are, what's a pain point that surprised you when you talk, when you actually listened, you know, what's your pain point and you would have never thought of it you, because often people, I feel we don't talk to our customers enough. What's one that uh, surprised you that you like? I would have never in a million years thought that was a pain point for this this manufacturer. Honestly, uh, in the, in the onset until I realized how how difficult it is, it's it's the warehousing and logistics part in terms of e-commerce. Um, if you ask a normal seller uh, who's selling on Amazon or any other platform, most of them will tell you, "Hey, I can learn how to you know order products, store products, ship product into the warehouse when I need to, and it's not too difficult, right?" Um, most of these vendors, in, in terms of dealing with an, uh, an online platform or, or learning the process or trying to figure out, you know, how they go about storing their products or, or, or getting enough ordered or or making sure they're covered for a busy season like Q4, December, um, it's, it's a constant struggle. 
there's a lot of times when I've talked to vendors where, um, you know, they come to me and they have what they think is a good game plan for getting through, let's just say, as an example, peak season. And I'll have to literally rip apart that plan and explain to them that there are things that they're not looking at that, that are going to negatively impact and make their plan impossible. For example, um, they say, hey, I'm going to send in a lot of stock you know, in the beginning of December, and that's what I'm going to sell for the holiday season. Well, I'll have to take a step back and tell them, actually, you're going to want to send that in November because if you start sending stock into Amazon for on December 1st for the holiday season, you're going to be lucky if it gets there by Christmas just because of the receiving delays. So then that evolves into a whole bunch of more potential problems for them or things they have to look into because, well, now I'm shipping a, a bunch of stuff even earlier. Um, that changes my workflow. That changes my warehouse operations. That changes what I need to order from China, you know, way back earlier in the year. Um, so it's kind of like a, 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 um, a domino effect, if you will. Eddie, I would never think that logistics would be easy, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a nightmare to me, actually. But w at what point did you decide you, I mean, you have a large facility yeah. where you can I handle this. My, my, so my joke is that if I didn't have this business, I would be working in some kind of logistics-based job because that's like my second language. Really? Uh, speak it really well. I can I can look at a product and know how much space it takes up without even doing much math. Um, it's just it just comes natural to me, right? So it, it takes a special skill to know that it's it's not for everybody. Um, but yeah, I mean this this warehouse that we have now. I mean this is we have now two locations. Um, you know this is just after five years of being in, when we started in our garage. But um, you know. <sighs> Going, growing, growing into a new location is always exciting because you're 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 upping your game you're opportunity, upping, upping, yeah, upping, opportunity. But it comes with pain points, right? You know, when I I went from a garage, then into a self storage facility where we operated out of for a year and a half or so, then into our first office, which was logistically impossible to to maneuver around because it was half office, half warehouse, and the warehouse was only twelve feet high, and there was no way to good no good way to store products that were coming in on pallets, so it was just a mess, right? Um, and then we moved into this to our first location, which is which was much better, right? Um, because it was a much bigger facility, and the the ceilings were higher, and you could we could put in racking and get a forklift and all that. But I wasn't experienced with any of that. I didn't know how to design a warehouse space. I didn't I'd never done that before. So it was kind of it was kind of learning as you go. And that, but that's that's honestly what I've what I've done my entire life. I, I'm not a book smarts person. I don't like sitting in a classroom or taking an educational course or something and trying to learn that way. I like to try. Uh, and do things that I think are the right way. And if I if they're not, then I fail and I try again and I learn from them. But that's honestly how I built this business. And it's 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 it takes a certain amount, a certain person to be willing to take that kind of risk. It's not for everybody, but that's why not everybody is cut out to be an entrepreneur. It's just it's what it is. It is a risk, and obviously you weighed the advantages and disadvantages. What made you think? Well, it's way more beneficial to have my own space as opposed to maybe hiring a warehouse to, to do it there, then you kind of just have someone else manage it and you do what you do best, going to conferences and just probably making those personal relationships. Yeah, so when we first started this e-commerce business, our model was buy very, very deep and very narrow. So we were buying, you know, we there was common times when we'd have 30 SKUs, that's it. Um, and this is when our business was still, was pretty was growing pretty rapidly. But we were buying, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20,000 of an item at one time for a significant discount. So we had, we had a pricing advantage, but, and these were items that were, you know, top rank SKUs across the categories we sold in. And it was, you know, they were, they were constantly flowing, right? Um, in more recent times, we've expanded that SKU selection. So we've gone, you know, wider in terms of product selection and not as deep. Obviously we'll do our initial model still if we, if it, if the uh, opportunity presents itself, but we just kind of added in some extra opportunity as well. Um, but really based on those particular models and setups and, and the logistics and the space that's required, you know, you, you do a cost analysis and you figure out, Hey, you know, for example, this space right here, the one office that we have is my rent is around $4,400 a month. Well, how much is it going to cost me to store 30, 40 truckloads plus the prep work that's going to be in here on a monthly basis? It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. So talk about staffing for a second. You're everything <laughs> that's, I talked about in the front of the introduction, you sound like every minute is accounted for in yep. your day. Yep. What does your day look like? And then how do you, who do you surround yourself with to, to make all this happen? Oh God, if I knew what my schedule was like, even on the morning I wake up, what it's going to be for that day, I would, I would be a happy man. But unfortunately that's not the case. I, I, I try to plan my day as much as possible. 
Uh, I live in my calendar that that I is attached to my email, so I can try to coordinate my schedule and, and know where I'm going and know what meetings I have, like like talking to you. Um, but it's just you know things happen and things have to get yeah. moved around. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about today. You don't have to talk about the details, but but like I think people talk about the you know the the luxury of this type of business. They don't talk about some of the challenges like today. So I don't yeah. know if you want to just mention yeah. some of the things that crop up, which is a reality of this type totally. of business. Totally. So here's the thing: when I was working my at my last corporate job, I was working you know five days a week, uh, forty hours a week. Right. That, that was the that was the go to thing. Like most corporate jobs. This job, uh, I'm working, maybe not sitting in my office and at my desk, but I'm working on something on my phone at my desktop at home or, or something on my mind, like literally 24-7. It just doesn't stop because that's the life of a business owner, right? Yes, you can delegate. Yes, you can outsource. And I'm not saying we don't do that. We do that, of course. But as a business owner, your business is your pot, is your money. And it's, it's, it's always on top of your mind. So like today, I went into the office and I had, last night I had done some work at home and I had about six, seven things on my to-do list that I wanted to get done before the end of the day. It's now one o'clock, and I have not even started that because this morning I get a call from uh, my freight forwarder that one of my containers from China was selected for a customs inspection. So you know, I'm finding throw out everything that, else out the window. <laughs> right. So I mean, I, you know, I'm I'm finding out now that this 20 foot container containing you know tons of product uh, is flag for custom inspection i've got to get all these certificates and compliance reports together and all this stuff sent over and by the way they want it like yesterday so uh you know it, it's difficult because now i got to go to the brand owner and explain to them what's going on with their products potentially you know we have an issue with ingredients or testing or whatever we don't know yet but you know there goes my morning right so now everything that i was supposed to do this morning and throughout the day has to wait and now it's got to get kind of jigsaw puzzled in, into my remaining open spaces, whether it be tonight or tomorrow, whenever, but you've, you've got to be willing to adapt as a business owner and you've got to be willing to work under pressure because if you are not willing to do those two things, honestly, you're setting yourself up for failure right from the start because it will happen. And I know that you, you, Eddie, you talk about automation is really important and you automate as much as possible. Can you talk about a little bit about what automation you put in place, whether it's a software or a service, and then um supporting staff like how many people do you need to run all these components because this seems like a lot of moving parts it is it is a lot of moving parts but when you look at when you look at automation it's really actually kind of simple so i look at i highly suggest anyone who's in who's a business owner use some kind of calendar app to keep track of your time or some kind of task management tool like asana for example is another one um it's a yeah. software program, i love but, asana yeah 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 so um and, and I look at it this way. Look, anything that you're doing on a repetitive basis, like look, review your week every week and see what you're doing on a repetitive basis. If you're repeating it, it's the same general task, the same same type of formula. That can be automated. You can create a, you know, there's a, the, for example, you can make a group, or you can make, you can use a Google Chrome extension like Loom, right, and create a, um, a, a guide, a video guide to somebody on how to do this task, whether it be paying bills or reaching out to a vendor or sending an email or following up on this, whatever it is. But if it's something that you can just teach somebody and you're doing all the time and you're repeating yourself on, outsource that. Move it over. The stuff that I want to be working on as a business owner is stuff that didn't happen to me last week or didn't happen to me last month. Something that's new that I've got to say, oh, hmm, how do I figure this out? How do I solve this problem? Or how do I you know, go into a space that I'm not yet in and expand my business? Right? Those, those things that as, an, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, that's what you want to work on. And I, and I, and I preach this when I speak. You want to work... If you if you're working in your business, that's not good. You want to work on it. There's a big difference. So, what other software do you use to manage the business? You said Asana. You use what else? Um, what do you yes. use on a daily basis? So, I live out of Outlook, for example. My email, my calendar is what that's what I love. Uh, that's <laughs> if I don't have that, it's like everything comes to a standstill because everything's stored there. Um, Asana, my organization, a lot of my files are shared between people that are involved in my organization. We use like uh, Box, Dropbox. Um, Skype um, for video, uh, Team Viewer for screen share. Um, you know, we have VAs who who um, help us with our business aspects, and you know, we obviously use those those tools to communicate with them. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm all for any product that allows us to be more efficient. Um, and I think a common misconception is, oh, well, I, I don't have the time to learn a new program or procedure, and I just I'm going to do it my way. But 
honestly, you've got to challenge yourself to, to expand your horizons and, and listen to other people or, or try a different program that might save you a lot of time because chances are it's worth it. So, and I know you talk about this a lot too. Um, when you started out, you didn't start out in wholesale. No, I didn't. So what did you do to start out and, and why? Yeah, so when we started the business, we did a mix. We did a mix of retail arbitrage and we did a mix of close out slash liquidation type goods because you know in 2012 that was just how a lot of people got started in the business and even today it's still true um but uh you know it was it was it was much easier as a business owner who was just operating out of the garage and didn't have that value proposition and that history of a business and you know success stories that we can share with vendors today built up yet um you know we could go to a store and we could buy whatever was available at a, at a good price and resell it for more money um, or we could just buy those those lots of you know just kind of goods on, on the internet and that's that's honestly how I how I did my first purchase you know um, I, t- I tell this story a lot I mean uh, I remember the day that I was sitting at my desk in my last job when I had my my phone literally just facing me and uh, on the on the desk like this and you know I'm working away and I get a text message from Capital One that, you know we've, we've now charged you five thousand dollars for this sealed bid that you placed on this auction which I you know never thought I was gonna win so I get this text message and I'm like, okay, never mind the fact that I have absolutely no idea how I'm going to pay that off because, you know, I'm a sales, I'm, a, I'm an entry level salesperson. You know, $5,000 in a month is not exactly easy to come by. Um, so I don't know how I'm going to pay that off, but, but bigger, but my logistics hat comes on, right? And I'm trying to think, well, where am I going to put those seven pallets of merchandise? <laughs> how am I going to sort that? How am I going to sell it fast enough? All of these things are running through my head. Mind you, I have absolutely no interest in what I'm doing at my actual job at this point because I'm so entrenched in what am I going to do here, right? But, you know, it, it goes back to, um, it really goes back to being a risk taker, right? I, I didn't know how I was going to do that, but it's it's that mentality of say yes and figure it out later, right? I do that a lot. <laughs> what was in that? What was in that initial order? It was a mixture of electronics. So it was a bunch of like keyboards, um, satellite receivers, cell phone uh, cases, covers, some miscellaneous stuff. I mean, we did profit on it. Um, How did you get rid of all of it? We did. We sold on Amazon. Yeah. Um, we had, we had we had an Amazon account by then, so um, obviously, you know, selling that type of those type of goods in 2012 is a lot easier than it is in 2018 um, because the platform has changed quite a bit. Um, but uh, you know, um, I, I think I think the whole I hope the whole lot was actually sold through Amazon. We didn't we didn't use a different channel for, for any of that. Actually, mm. come to think of it. So why wholesale now? So you transitioned to wholesale. Yep. Yep. So, why? Yeah. Well, go ahead. Yeah. So the the retail arbitrage part of our business, we had built that into a, a, a seven figure business by the time we were done with that in 2014. Um, and my business partner and I had 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 a discussion. And we said, look, if, if we want to scale this into a into a multi million dollar business and continue to grow year after year and, and have those new opportunities and, and you know really take it to the next level, can we do that with this model? And the answer we got was, no, we can't. Um, it's just not feasible with the two of us working the way we are. Um, we were already, as it was, you know, working throughout the night sometimes and over the weekends. It just, it was, we were maxed out, right? Um, so what we determined that the wholesale model offered us was the ability to source products directly from manufacturers and distributors. Um, so we can source a lot more product in a lot less time. Plus, we then had the relationship with those suppliers, which kind of correlates to where Amazon was going because they wanted that platform cleaned up. They wanted those those people to have the, you know, the, the solid uh, paper trail of their inventory and, you know, with the whole um, being authorized to sell in categories and brands and now with brand registry, it's, it's kind of taken a different turn. So um, we feel being being operating this model today when we have those tight, close-knit relationships um, gives us a better, uh, I guess, a, best, a better security, if you will, in our business because when any potential problems come up, we know where to go. We can usually come back to the problem pretty quickly. Is it common that if they're working with you, they will stop selling other smaller people to sell? Yes. Like, will they work exclusively with you? Yes. I mean, it's not 100%, but it's common that um, when we do approach somebody and we, you know, we do pitch them pretty hard with what our capabilities are and what some of the value-added features we can bring to the table are, yes, they usually do um, work with us on a more exclusive relationship. And I imagine that's, that's is that more unique too that not all the sellers not many of them have their own like logistics and and facility like you do yeah, yeah not all of them do but you know you have to remember that a, a lot of sellers they'll go up to a, a manufacturer or a vendor and they'll they'll ask for the exclusive right out of the gate hey 
you know, let me be your exclusive seller and let me just sell to me directly. But I go back to what I said earlier. With that pitch, your your pitch is only about you. And the brand might not care. The brand most likely doesn't care. So I never lead with, hey, give me an exclusive or let me be your own only authorized seller. I lead with the, you know, what are you looking for and what value adds do I know based on my business that I can bring to the table to fill in those holes that you're talking about? Because I feel uh, that if I can fill in those holes for the vendor and if I can really solve their problems, what I'm looking for in terms of exclusivity or really ramping up that, that sales velocity or really making money on that brand is going to come naturally because they're going to trust you and they're going to they're gonna see the value you bring to the table. So that's, that's kind of the route I do. Yeah. The, and obviously, it seems like you're very focused on wholesale. Yep. Talk about your um, thoughts on private labels. So um, I feel in today's Amazon environment in 2018 that there are two great models for Amazon. And it's either wholesale doing it the right way, meaning you have the relationships with your manufacturers and distributors. You're not just buying product and selling it without them knowing where you're selling it. That's a key part of that, right? Um, so you either have that, you have that in place, you have those relationships, or you are doing private label where you are, you know, sourcing your own products from overseas and you're manufacturing some, you know, type of device or some type of product and you're then selling that under your own brand. I feel both of those are good models for Amazon. However, I feel both of them do offer, do come with their unique challenges. Obviously, wholesale is challenging because you have to, Basically, even though you're the customer, you're the salesperson until you're in with the vendor, right? And they have to trust you. So that's a, that's a challenge, right? Um, the products that you sell are not your own. So, you know, the fate of those products is, is never really certain, right? But, you know, you, unlike private label, I think the, the concern with private label is you've got to research a product. You've got to find a product that, you know, that... You have to you make have, a name for yourself and you got to prove it out. You got to brand it. You got to figure out if it's going to sell well. You got to promote it. You got to really compete. So th- th- there's pluses and minuses to both. I feel that again, though, from from a platform perspective, I think both of them can be uh, very lucrative. So I mean, you're a very experienced seller in general. What have you thought about going the private label route before? Yeah. So you know, uh, both Greg and I are not opposed to that at all. I think this year, you know, it's one of our objectives to try to get into that, in, into that a little bit more. And, and you also have your finger on the pulse of a lot of stuff that is is high volume yeah but here's the thing i mean when you're in wholesale there's a lot of things you can do in wholesale that overlap with private label people don't realize you know um when you find a wholesale product and let's just say it's no longer available but it's been selling well on amazon well you can make a similar product and it's not available anymore take over that market right um if you find a product on amazon that sells really well but the but the reviews aren't very good how do you make it better right um if you're working with a brand and let's just say they have they're selling a I don't know, a, a black widget, right? And that sells really, really well. Well, what if you go to them and say, hey, make a blue, red, and white one, right? Um, it's just, it's still the same product, but now you potentially could have that exclusivity um, and you can kind of piggyback off of your existing history with that product. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of overlap between the two that I don't think people really take advantage of, uh, and it could be. Yeah, so you can make modifications to products and then ask for exclusivity, which is they're not even making it anyways, and obviously... They ask you to put in a minimum order. Yeah, but the, you have to understand, the majority of the time that manufacturers and vendors don't want to give you exclusivity is because you're not the only outlet they're selling to for Amazon. They're, they're selling to retailers, they're selling to brick and mortar stores. So they have, to, they have to protect that and be cautious of that as well. But if you're bringing to them an opportunity for a new product and you know it's, it's not currently in the marketplace and you're giving them this opportunity saying, hey... I think I can sell this product or I think we can do really well with this, but it's not currently in any of their other distribution areas. Well, their risk is a lot lower if they give you that as an exclusive and you can run with it. So again, it's a win-win on both sides, but you got to be the one to think about those things. Totally. Um, and so you sell on different channels. So yep. obviously we talk about Amazon's a behemoth in this space, right? But what other channels do you sell on? So Amazon, Jet, Walmart, Groupon, Rakuten, Sears, uh, Price falls, uh, U.S. government, B two B, too many to name, honestly. But you know, again, with the channels, we do we do things a little bit differently, right? So, um, uh, for example, if we have a vendor who wants to go into brick and mortar, right? Um, they want to go to they want to sell their product in to a, a major retailer, right? But that major retailer um, wants to only buy product domestically. They only want to buy it from the states. Well, that brand owner, I've, I, I, we have a brand owner like this where. Um, they only sell product out of their warehouse in China, FOB, full container. 
Well, for me, I see that as an opportunity because I can buy FOB full container from that vendor. I can bring it into my, my location as a distributor, right? So that's even less than wholesale pricing. And then I can wholesale it out to that major retailer. So I'm so for literally moving product from one warehouse to another, you know, B2B, I can make, you know, 30, 40 points on the deal. So it's worth it for me. I've got, you know, if they give me a forecast and, and they're, you know, cutting me POs, what's the risk? Right. So I, I do things a little bit more. Uh, it's just uh, because uh, they want to deal with someone in the U.S. Is that the main pain point? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, there's headaches like like there's headaches with buying from overseas. Like you like I explained. like you just, like just <laughs> happened today. I've got that container that's, that's being inspected and, and who knows how long it's going to take for that to get released. I mean, it's a, it's a pain point. But, you know, this vendor happens to know, hey, if I buy from the States, it's, I can get it in three or four days and be done with that. Right. And they'll pay a premium for it. But who's going to be the person that that allows that to happen in the middle because the vendor doesn't want to do that. The buyer doesn't want to do that. So there's an opportunity in the middle for someone like me to compete. Yeah. And I want to talk about, because I know you breezed over it, the U.S. government, right? That's a unique thing that not many people are doing. But um, talk about headaches from China for a second. Just what are some things that you would never have known if you weren't in this business? Like you said, they just decide to inspect a container. What else are big holdups that people should be weary of? Um, well, I'll, I'll give you the most obvious, which a lot of people don't know when they first go into sourcing overseas, is uh, they don't operate in February. <laughs> uh, Chinese New Year, yeah, they're shut down. So you don't get your order in by the end of January, you wait until March. And, and honestly, if you don't know about that, and that's around the time of your order, it, it's a huge problem, right? Because you're waiting a month. Um, then it's just that. Then it's just the. I think it's mostly the pure logistics of it. Um, you, you know, you're trying to fill a container. Uh, when you get stuff on uh, a truck in the U.S., it's mostly going to come to you on pallets. Whereas when you're buying overseas, it's going to come floor loaded. So all those cases are just stacked in a container, and you're manually unloading them one by one because they're not on skids. You know, in China, they don't believe in that because it's it's a waste of space. That six inches all the way across the floor of the container that's a lot of space. Um, so you know that that's that's something you got to think about too when you gotta you can't unload that container like you would a truck very easily because it's one by one, right? Um, you know, obviously shipping times to get here is significant. It's you know, four to six weeks, depending where exactly in the country you are. Um, payments, uh, instead of getting net terms and instead of getting products delivered to your warehouse and you getting, you know, net 30, net 60 to pay it. So you being able to sell a lot of inventory right away, not in China. I mean, you're paying 30% when you place your order, you're paying the, usually the other 70% when it's ready to leave the port. And again, you still have four to six weeks for it to get here. So your your cash flow is fronting a lot of cash. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of moving parts with with uh, overseas importing. So these are probably all I'm assuming big mistakes people make or people meaning you've made them and other yep. people have made them uh, in wholesalebreakthrough.com and I want to we'll talk about that too because you you decided on an interesting approach to wholesale breakthrough and it's not like your typical step by step and we'll talk about why but. I have to talk about the U.S. government because you just threw yep. that in there, yep. and it's like, yeah, we have the U.S. government. Um, so, <laughs> so, so basically, here's what you need to: the biggest thing you need to know about the U.S. government sales or sales to the U.S. government, whether it be military, you know, regional, Department of Defense, whatever it is, anything government related falls under this umbrella. If you are a, I'll give you all three. If you are a women-owned minority small business. And you are not dealing with government, you're missing out a hmm. lot, because the, you, your con there's contracts in the government in, in almost any area of the hmm. government that are literally designated for you, before anyone else can bid on them. They are there for you, waiting for you to bid on them and say, hey, I can supply you with whatever the widget is they're looking for, and it can be something so easy. I've seen we we've had offers where they're just looking for a, a case of first aid kits, which you can source from almost anybody. And these first aid kits, they're willing to, they'll give you the price that they've paid before. So you can almost, you almost, <laughs> they're willing to pay, right? So they say, oh, we paid $35 for these first aid kits. Well, I go to look them up online. Yeah. I can buy them for 12 I've got no fees to do it. I mean, there's a lot of paperwork and there's a lot of, right. you know, language you got to read through, the people, which, which is majority what turns people off. But yeah. the potential there is just insane. You know, I don't know, my mind goes, you know, they call it retail arbitrage. I wouldn't name a site government arbitrage because that would be, that would sound bad, but that's, maybe it's women, women arbitrage with the government or something. 
<laughs> I mean, I mean, that's your next course. Yeah, yeah you know, honestly, I mean, I'm, I'm all about equality in the marketplace, and I and and this is why I bring up that topic because you know, there's, especially like take speaking, right? There's a lot, there's a lot of uh, talk right now about you know we need more women speakers in the marketplace, and I'm all for that, right? But here's an opportunity, here's a business opportunity that is literally a gold mine for that group of people. It's a gold mine, but there's so many people that I know that are in that group that aren't taking advantage of it because they don't know about it or they've been turned off by it somehow, whatever. But you know, if you are in any of those three categories that I mentioned, women own minority or your small business, which is pretty much everybody here, small business, I think it's under five or 10 million a year. It's, it's pretty big still. Um, you're a small business. So uh, chances are you at least qualify for one, if not two or three, and you can really do some and if you're a woman minority small business, then you have all three. It's a trifecta. It literally is a trifecta. Golden. Yep. Um, research. So, yep. I mean, what? I guess, Eddie, you know, you have so much that you're executing on now. What What would you give away now that um, you can't execute on? But you're like, this is a huge opportunity. We don't. We don't have the. You know, right now we're just busy with too much. What should people go after? I want. I want to talk about it kind of in the frame of your your research for new products because you're you're probably swamped with the products you have. But you're. Pro I, I just know you a little bit where you're probably always looking for the next thing. So how do you research right now? Um, I know you go to a lot of trade shows, and then what's something you're like. I know that this is a huge opportunity, but there's no way I can we can execute it on all the other opportunities that we have. So, so let me let me let me answer this question by by kind of expanding on that on that trade show part because yeah, I think it's a bit, right. Yeah. I go to trade shows. The, the type of vendors that I'm looking for are the established brands, the larger brands, the ones who really have a, a good presence that I can that I can take and pick up, and within a sh relatively short amount of time, I can really take them to the next level, right? It's harder to do that with the brands that are smaller, that are unknown, that you're trying, they're still trying to build their presence. However, those brands are the ones that, more likely than not, are the ones willing to talk to the, the sellers, right? I don't have the time to be talking to those smaller brands because it's not what I've built this business to today. I'm working with the mm -hmm. larger ones. Um, so, you know, I, I, there's a lot of people that I travel with that go to the same trade shows as I do. It, it just happens, right? And I see them there. Um, and even with all the work that I do and the work that, other sellers of my size that do at the trade shows, there is still so much untapped potential with the with the brands that are literally there with their CEO or their president as the only person running the booth. They got a small, you know, five by five, five by ten booth, whatever, you know, maybe five ten products, and they're just it's literally untouched uh, opportunity, and I see it every single time. So people will say, oh well, you know, I don't want to go to trade show because there's so many people there who have who have more experience than me, or you know that. It can offer more than I can. It's not true. Um, all it takes, honestly, the, over and above what you can offer as a as a business, it's more about your relationship and what you can, how you can work with somebody. Yeah. Um, what are some of the trade shows that you recommend? You, um, you said ASD is one. So, so ASD is a closeout liquidation for the most yeah. part. It's heavy in that in that space. There there are areas where it's not where you're dealing with manufacturers and brands, but it's not. It's not. A, I don't like to say it's a traditional type show where. The entire show is manufacturers and brands where you know it's you, you won't find basically closeouts at, at, at a traditional type show so um more traditional shows outside of asd depends on again depends on your category but you can look at like the baby show you can look at hardware show you can look at toy fair you can look at um there's just there's tons right it just depends on the category that you're in yep um, but you got to remember that the traditional type shows are the ones that you're going to be talking to the manufacturers and brand owners and their guard is up right because they've got brands to protect whereas if you're working with closeout liquidation well it doesn't really matter as much because it's not their stuff right um so when you're working with the brand owners there specifically understand that they're going to vet you they're going to ask you questions they're going to ask you more about you and they're going to investigate who you are they're going to look you up online they're going to they're going to look that stuff up because they want to know that you are indeed who you say you are um you're asking them to trust you with a brand that they might they may have you know, years or decades of experience trying to build. And if they can't trust you, they're not going to give you the opportunity because that's too much risk to, to, to do, to take over someone who just claims they can do, you know, X, Y, and Z. I'm sure in your career, you've had home runs, doubles, singles. What's been the worst product choice that <laughs> oh, you made? 
Um, that you're still handing out for holidays to, to your family. <laughs> you know, I don't. Luckily, I don't have anything that's that's. I'm still handing out for from from inception. Thank God. <laughs> um, but there was. I'll go back to when I first started. So um, when I first started Amazon, I didn't really investigate what this whole rank thing meant, and I thought, oh well, you know, if it's on Amazon, it must sell, right? Everyone, everyone uses Amazon. Cool. So I bought around 300 of these. Lexmark inkjet printers that were probably from, I don't know, early 2000s. I thought it was a great deal because I paid $25 a piece for them, which was, come to realize it was highway highway robbery for these things because they retail for like $40. Um, but they were on Amazon because no one was selling them. The price was inflated, right? Um, for like $125. Well, so we, we, we got them all in, 300 of them. We sent in a couple pallets to Amazon and lo and behold, they start selling, you know, one, two, three a week, right? Well, when the customer got it and they realized what a piece of junk it was, they returned it for $125, and we never ended up selling them. We all got them as returns, right? Um, so long story short, that that inventory uh, ended up being liquidated back out, and we lost a lot of money on that. <laughs> Seemed like a good deal at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah not so much anymore. <laughs> um, categories you stay away from? Yeah, uh, good question. So um, clothing. Um, Mainly because I don't the, the the rate of returns and my inexperience with clothing I I'm not comfortable with so uh, I stay away from that one um, I know I know I know people that do really well in it though so I it's a double edged sword uh, jewelry Amazon is really picky about that especially the fine jewelry category it's next to impossible to get in that category in the first place why are they so picky the, you know the 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 coloring the weights the sizes if you're if you're I've heard if you're within like you know a gram off you can really just you can lose your account you can be flagged. Wow. Uh, it's just not worth the headache. So what do people who are selling jewelry, is there a workaround that they sell in, if not in jewelry or no? Uh, I honestly don't know. I mean, you I, know, it's I, like kind of like going to U of I. You don't, if you want to get into engineering, you go into agriculture, major first and then transfer. Yeah. So what, what's, what's the workaround? I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, there I, isn't I, one. honestly, I, I don't know too many people that are really hitting it out of the park with jewelry. The people that I know tend to stay away from that category. I just, you know, it's, it's a risky category. Um, the other categories that I stay away from are like your a lot of your topical and adjustable type stuff, um, just because with product recalls and certain ingredients that you that end up being the product that you would never have known are in the product that are technically against Amazon's terms of service or any platform's terms of service or just liability in general with somebody who says that it harmed them, it's just it's risky to me. I, I like to stay with the more. The stuff that's easier, you know, toys, electronics, housewares, lawn and garden, pet baby, those pet baby like toys, things like that. Um, those are my more comfortable categories. So back to wholesale breakthrough. And when we talked before, you said there's no set true way to do this business. And you modeled wholesale breakthrough because of that. So yep. what do you mean by that? And how did you structure wholesale breakthrough from the information piece? Yeah, so so wholesale breakthrough is the consulting arm of our operation, right? It's it's where people can come to, learn, you know, they join our Facebook group or they go on our website wholesalebreakthrough.com and they and they learn more about us and the business that we built, right? Um, and here's what here's what how here's, here's what I thought. I've seen over the last, especially two three years, when I when I've participated on panels or as a speaker, a lot of people ask me for advice on this business or or to teach them or to coach them and and help them with with what they're doing, right? And so I looked into it, and I, and I kind of took a, 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 a backseat on that for a long time. I thought about it. And there are yeah, so Yeah, because you are front and center, and you are, you know, I'm, speaking I'm, I'm a the, lot. On the speaking side, but yeah. not on the – I haven't been on the, on the course slash consulting side purposely. Um, yeah. but Why? What I, but what I, what I realized is that there's no one right way to do this business. So rather than sell you a course – for a thousand, two thousand dollars, whatever it is, and say, here's my go-to proven way of doing this business, which, you know, try it and try it and hopefully you succeed. Um, I said, hey, let me just offer myself out as a resource to somebody who's trying to build a business as a expert. Both Greg and myself are resources, and that's what we created. Own your breakthrough, which is hashtag Own Your Breakthrough. It's the it's the premium, the premier um, e-commerce uh, community that we've developed under Wholesale Breakthrough. So it's a low monthly fee, seventy bucks a month. You have access to myself and Greg as your dedicated resources for any questions related to either wholesale, e-commerce, Amazon, multi-channel, whatever, um, and we'll answer anything anything you have. Um, 
in addition to that, we have made partnerships with a lot of the service providers in the industry to give you discounts on the things that you either already use or would want to use in your business. So it almost pays for itself. Um, so what we see it is, hey, you know, we make our money obviously on the subscription. We're giving you a benefit by giving you all these, giving you our knowledge and also the um, partner offers. Uh, it's a win-win on both sides. Yeah. It's not costing an arm and a leg either. Yeah. I'm, how did you decide on that, that pricing? Because it seems like someone's doing wholesale, it's almost like a no-brainer. Yep. I mean, subtract the all the benefits. Like I'm looking at it right now. There's um, an offer, like if someone has a free suspension prevention you know, assessment, which is valuable, eGrowth Partners is a 10% off tax charge, is a 10% off inventory lab. There's free, sh there's free shipping options on Uline. There's, you know, freight joy legit. There's merchant words, all this stuff. So minus all of that, yep. your time's valuable. You're super busy. Yep. Um, how do you decide on that? Because some, I mean, it's someone doing wholesale, they could, they could ask you one question and it could be worth like 10 years of this. And you know what? I hope they do. I hope they do, honestly, because th that way I know they've succeeded. And and I've, I've actually done my part to help help another business owner succeed. It's more about, you know, giving back to the community and helping somebody than just making money for me. I, I've yeah. always been. Right? Who is a good fit for this? Like um, at what level? What level? I would, I would say anyone from your entry level to your intermediate to looking to expand to try to get on to different platforms or really try to um, build a relationship with a brand manufacturer, trying to get more exclusives. You know, really anyone. Um, I, I, I've, I've had people approach me who um, have been in the wholesale business for two, three years and have done several million dollars who, for whatever reason, they're, they're looking for help in a certain area and they know we can help them and they, they come to us, right? Um, but before Own Your Breakthrough, the only thing I was offering was hourly consulting and we would talk for an hour just like this and we'd answer the questions. But, you know, that was fine, but a lot of times someone wouldn't need to answer, need to take up the entire hour and they, didn't, they wouldn't have you know, that much to ask about, right? So I said, hey, if I can give this community, uh, make this community available for, for relatively inexpensive price, you know, it's, it's inexpensive because I'm not giving you, I've not developed a course, a, a specific formula of, of, of that I'm going to teach you, uh, something that you're going to buy and retain and watch over and over again, right? This is only going to be successful if you're willing to ask the questions, come to us for help, tell us about your business, you know, get the feedback that you need to grow because if you're just going to be in the in the community sign up for it and just watch i mean you can do that but i don't feel that you use it to your best potential the more you ask the better you're going to get value wise out of the program yeah totally um eddie first of all thank you so much i have uh two last questions but uh, i really appreciate your time and everyone should check out wholesalebreakthrough.com check out what he has going on and he speaks um, all over the country. Um, I can't even keep track of your schedule. I don't know how you do. Um, so if you are going to a, a conference, e-commerce, otherwise, look out for him and say hello and thank him for the information because he does put out a lot of really great information online. Um, two questions um, I always ask is, one, um, since it's Inspired Insider, what's been a low moment in the business? And then, two, what's been a really proud moment milestone that you were able to accomplish oh geez um a low moment you can't count this, this morning you know <laughs> this morning does not count um <laughs> no I, I mean um okay i'll give you a low moment low moment so i'll, I'll preface this by saying that your low moments in your business they're going to happen much more often than you think there are if not every day at least during the week, some point that I'm, I think myself, I'm so done with this. I'm out. This is just not as <laughs> yeah. all as all possible. But you know what? It's part of business. Um, so Lomo, Lomo, I can specifically think of is when we were trying to expand from our last warehouse, and we had found a location that we thought was going to be great. I, I saw it like four or five times. We had all had it all mapped out. Did a ton of work for it. You know, figured out where everything was going to go. Figure out our cost analysis, everything. We go to put in, uh, go to sign on their contract and get the paperwork going. It was leased to somebody else. So now I'm in a position where I'm my lease on my current space is expiring. I don't want to renew it because it's not sufficient for us. And now I have to start all over again while I'm trying to build my business and try to find a different space, which I didn't know if it was available to me. So it, it's you have to scramble big time with that. Scramble and it's defeating because you know you want to grow, but 
these things get in the way and then you feel like you're restrained. You can't, you can't go forward. Right. Um, so that was definitely a low moment because it, it took another three, four five months for me to get to me to find this place that I have now. Um, and, and, you know, do all the work involved to, to, to build it out and to set it up how I see fit and, and figure out what that was going to cost me. But, um, it really slowed me down in the summer of 2015, I think it was, um, when we were looking to move because that's like all I was focusing on day in and day out during the summer months. And it was just really a drag. So that was one of them. That's a lot. I've, I've, ex it's painful. I've been through something similar. It's a painful experience. What about a um, proud moment, milestone that you hit that you were especially proud of? Um, honestly, I go back to, to myself as being an entrepreneur who likes to give back, right? When I, when I was working my corporate job, uh, I told myself, hey, you know, I want to work for myself, but I, want to, I don't want to do it unless I can give back to others and help others along the way. So the fact that I can look back today and I can say, hey, I'm working for myself, I have my own business, I don't have a regular job I have to go to, but at the same time, I can I can have the luxury of traveling almost whenever I want to all these conferences, vacations, whatever you want, you know, to do, um, and, or or I can volunteer my time at, at schools or with DECA, the the national competition, and I can give my expertise to somebody else to try to help them guide them along that same path. That's a milestone for me because I, I didn't I don't I don't truly feel successful unless you're able to. Um, send the letter back down, if you will, and help somebody else. It's more than just about your own success. Talk about Last for the Troops for a second. Yeah. So Last for the How'd Troops. How'd you get involved with that? Yeah, so when I was on a, a cruise ship vacation, um, gee, I want to say it was uh, around 2014, if, I'm, if I got that right. I have to check the dates. But um, I, went to, I went to a comedy show and uh, that they had and saw the comedian. And I noticed at the end of the show, he says, hey, you know, um, I run this organization called Laugh for the Troops. We're just getting it off the ground, um, and you know we help we help injured soldiers and uh, for, with so, those suffering from PTSD with with through some of their troubles. We try to raise money for them, and uh, you know the military causes have always been close to me because I feel they give a lot and we owe them a lot in return. Um, so I approached him, you know, a, a, after the after the cruise is over, and I said, hey, um, you know, tell me more about the organization. I want to get involved. Here's some more about me. Um, became really good friends with with the with the um uh the the head of that organization and ended up traveling to to several events throughout the country both in uh, like in colorado and florida doing some uh, charity fundraisers and you know obviously it's, it's a volunteer work for me it's 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 you know giving some time but um the satisfaction that you get when you see uh people benefiting from your hard work is is you, you can't even describe you know when i went to to the event in, in colorado for example uh, I stood outside my hotel room, and I still and I still remember this to this day. Um, they had a climbing wall that they had set up right outside the um, right outside the hotels for the Winter Olympics that they were hosting there. Um, the uh, for those for those for that group of people, and um, this guy was wheelchair bound and had uh, one leg, and he was able to do this climbing wall by himself. Wow! And I have a video of it somewhere. I have to I have to dig it up, but to watch that right. And to think, wow, you know, we think we have problems as regular humans. If this guy can do that, defying all odds, you know, it just gives you an, another sense of motivation. Totally. In whether you run with it, it puts business. things in perspective, right? Sure, for sure. Well, if you find that video, I'll clip it on to the end of this. Yeah, I can. I'll do you have it, it somewhere? I do. Yeah, I gotta find it. I don't know if it's on my phone or my computer, but I do have it. Yeah. Well, we'll want to preserve it, so send it, and uh -huh. we'll we'll clip it on the end of this, and that would yeah. be really cool. Um, so thanks for sharing that, by the way. That's I love hearing those stories, and you know the ultimate reason why you do this is also because you want to perpetuate, um, and you know you uh, give your expertise away. Um, I've seen it in many many uh, instances with you, and if, to the next generation too. What's the best idea you've heard at, at one of these DECA competitions? Um, so last year I was at the collegiate DECA com competition in. Uh... Anaheim and this guy who he wasn't in he wasn't a regular college student because collegiate DECA can be anyone from any age group anyone who's in college right so he can be a little bit older um, and he had come out with some kind of he had like a basically a, a system where when you're shopping for clothes online what's the biggest thing that you have uh, an issue with right it's sizing and you don't know what it 
how it's going to fit, right? Um, basically, this this would design a system to where your 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 measurements and your overall shape, right, would the the vendor or the the uh, person the store you're buying it from knew exactly what kind of size you were, and without even you having to try it on. Hmm. Uh, it's hard to explain. It's Without some kind of AI technology or something? Some, or something? Yeah, like, like you could order the products, it would know what your size were, and it was almost like a guaranteed fit, if you will. Um, and the success rate that they were targeting was like 95 plus percent. It was crazy. So obviously wow. it didn't, it didn't uh, reduce the fact that you might not like how it felt because that's obviously a little bit diffi- more difficult, but it really eliminated the, the size issue. Hmm. Uh, instead of saying, hey, are you small, medium, large, extra large, or whatever, um, it was more customized to you as a person. So um you know get your measurements and then all the stores would know exactly how how their how their specific line or their specific product would fit you and it was almost like eliminated the returns process because one of the biggest issues with uh clothing retailers um is the cost for them is the returns aspect of people who didn't like the size right so that he figured well if i can eliminate that risk a little bit and if i can save them even a fraction of what they're currently spending in return costs it adds up to billions of dollars a year so he's like if i can perfect this software mm. this this type of system, I uh, can make a lot of money. And it was one of those things that, you know, you were sitting there trying to judge him and critique him and fill out the form. And at the same time, you're thinking, wow, that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so. Cool. Eddie, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out wholesalebreakthrough.com and uh, hopefully I'll see you in Chicago. Thanks so much.